Let's move into the bathroom. A lot of products here that we're using on our skin, in our mouth. What do we need to be most cognizant of? Well, let's be cognizant of what's going in our mouth. Simply because the amount that gets absorbed through the oral cavity can be higher than you might think because we have underneath the tongue um, what is known as sublingual absorption. So if you put certain medications, will tell you to put it under the tongue and hold it there for a little while because there's a pretty high level of chemical absorption there. So we need to be careful with what we're putting in our mouths. For example, oral care products, toothpaste. What kinds of ingredients are we having in our toothpaste. If you're using something that has something irritating like sodium lauryl sulfate, this is a detergent. This is a surfactant. That's what's causing that foaming effect. So if you're brushing your teeth and you see all that foam, check your toothpaste ingredients for sodium lauryl sulfate. If you've got recurring canker sores, that can be linked to the sodium lauryl sulfate because there are studies showing that this ingredient destroys the oral mucosa which is not a good thing. We need to keep our gums and our tissues healthy in order for oral health and overall health. So look out for that. And also the artificial colors, the, the dyes, the flavors, as well as fluoride as well. How do you feel about mouthwash? Mouthwash is not something that I personally use. And I've also seen several dental experts speak on this as well from a microbiome perspective. And I think this is something that we need to be careful of. Because once you are introducing something like alcohol, alcohol is a penetration enhancer. What that means is that it increases the penetration of chemicals across tissues, meaning on the skin, in the mouth, it increases the pen chemical penetration. It's a penetration enhancer. So if you're rinsing your mouth with alcohol, look at what else is in that mouth rinse. Are you you know, having all of these synthetic dyes and saccharin and flavors and colors and un these undesirable, unnecessary ingredients in there, then you might want to reconsider. If you have poor oral health, that's something you have to check with your dentist about. But it could also be an issue with the toxic absorption because of the ingredients. What about dental floss? What do we want to look out for there? Definitely look out for plastic dental floss that is coated. So these slippery slide glide type flosses, tapes, dental tape, I think, I believe they're called. That's something to look out for because those were found to be coated with Teflon. Again, these PFAS chemicals and you're uh, going in between your teeth. Sometimes people floss more than once a day, multiple times a day over the course of a lifetime in a very vascularized area, meaning if there's an area of high blood flow, that means also high chemical absorption. So again, the mouth absorbs a lot of chemicals. So we need to be careful with the types of dental floss we're using, especially if you've got kids. So definitely look for my personal favorite type of floss is made with silk. I use silk floss that's coated in organic plant wax. And what do you use for a toothpaste? Toothpaste, I switched to a hydroxy appetite toothpaste under the advice of my dentist, and it actually significantly helped improve my my oral health. Um, I've been I was using fluoride free toothpaste for some time, but didn't really feel like it was truly benefiting my teeth. It was just more of a I need to use toothpaste kind of thing. So I just got something the best that I could. But once I switched to a hydroxy appetite toothpaste. I did notice an improvement in my oral health. Yeah, I'm a fan of that as well. Let's move into the shower. Things we're putting on our hair, on our body. What mistakes are we making there? Yeah, let's think about what we're doing. So let's, I'm, go I'm going to paint the picture. When you get in the shower, you grab your, you turn on the water. Let's say, let's say you're doing a hot shower. Your pores are open. Your skin is hydrated. So what's increasing the rate of chemical absorption is the hydration status of your skin. If your skin's dry, it won't be absorbing as much as when it's hydrated and moist and wet in the shower. And then you've got the uh, heat element, right? We mentioned heat. Anytime there's heat, there's also an increased rate of chemical transfer and absorption. So a hot shower, you're grabbing your shampoo, you've got your harsh surfactants, your fragrance chemicals in there, these are affecting your, your scalp health, 
your microbiome, as well as the fragrances with endocrine disruptors in them. You have a high amount of vascularization in the scalp as well. And scalp skin absorbs more chemicals than, let's say, the skin on your elbow. So when you're shampooing every day, yes, the product is rinse off. It's not sitting on the skin. That's also going to increase chemical absorption, but you're still getting absorption at some level. But that's not the only product you're using, right? Then you grab your conditioner. Let's say as a someone who's got longer hair, you, you're putting your conditioner in. That's got also maybe some silicones in it. It's got some um, PEGs. These are petroleum-derived ingredients. They can have formaldehyde in them. Then you're also having the fragrance chemicals again. So you're layering on top of one another these chemical exposures. Then you've got your body wash and your soap, and that's also scented and fragranced. And that's also affecting your skin health and you're putting it all over your body. That's a large area. So the factors that are relevant when we look at chemicals and chemical exposure are the frequency, duration, the concentration, as well as the route of exposure. So for a lot of these, we're inhaling them as well as absorbing the chemicals through the skin. So these are not exposures that people think of necessarily as increasing your toxic burden, but they are. So far, we've went over a number of different routes of exposure, one being inhaling. We talked about in the mouth, the uh, mucosa and absorbing there. And then we've talked about the skin now and how when it's wet, it can be, it is more absorbent. What does the body have in these different areas, mechanisms to protect itself? And what areas are we more vulnerable in? The general mechanism that we have of protection is the stratum corneum. That is the outer layer of the skin, the dry skin on the very surface. That is supposed to be our barrier from the outside world, keeping the inside inside and the outside outside. But unfortunately, a lot of these chemicals, like I mentioned, the alcohol is a penetration enhancer. It will affect the integrity of that barrier. So you're getting more chemical absorption. So it's you have to look at the types of products that you're using where you're using it, how often are they, how long are they staying on your skin? How old are you? If you're a child, then this toxic exposure is orders of magnitude higher risk than compared to an adult. Does that again dip when somebody gets really old and they're a senior? When you get older, then toxic absorption is it would be worse for vulnerable con uh, populations, for example, children and elderly. They're disproportionately affected. Simply because the body slows down as, you, as we age. So the mechanisms of detoxification that we have are reduced, right? When you're young, they're not fully developed. When you're an adult, then they are fully developed. And then when you get older into, the, into your elder years then the rate of detoxification goes down again. All right, let's stay in the bathroom. Coming out of the shower, let's talk about deodorant, skin creams, makeup, different things people put on the body before they get dressed. Yeah, so people uh, put your body lotion on. That's covering a large area again. It's sitting on the skin. So if something's sitting on your skin, it has the opportunity to become absorbed into your bloodstream until you wash it off, essentially then you're adding your deodorant. If you're a woman, then your lymph tissue and breast tissue are in almost direct proximity to your underarms. And depending on the type of deodorant you're using, it can be a high risk, like your conventional aluminum salt containing deodorants. These have aluminum salts that are physical blockers of your sweat ducts. And so what's going on there is that salt is getting lodged into your sweat duct and preventing sweat from coming out. Sweat is a detoxification pathway that we do not benefit from blocking. In fact, there are studies showing that when you induce sweat, that you're increasing the rate of detoxification of a lot of these chemicals of concern, bisphenols, phthalates, heavy metals, pesticides. So we don't want to block our sweat. I understand it might not be comfortable for someone to have sweaty underarms, that's a whole different situation that we need to look at. But if you are long-term using these antiperspirants with these aluminum salts, you could actually be increasing your odor. 
there's a study showing that with <laughs> more use of these aluminum containing antiperspirants, the underarm odor actually got worse. So not only are you increasing your toxic load this way, but you could also be making the situation worse. Is that because we're disrupting the microbiome there? Yes, that's one aspect of it as well, is the microbes in the underarm are what determine the odor. They're producing the odor. So if you're blocking them, then that's changing the composition of the, of the population there. All right, let's talk about makeup, different things people would put on their face, different cream there and, and products. When it comes to makeup, this one is also a leave-on product. So you leave it on your face and it doesn't come off until you wash it. And generally, people apply daily. Let's take, for example, um, let's, I'll walk through a typical routine. Let's say you put on your, your, your lotion, your skincare. Um, maybe you've got five products. I've seen even videos of people doing eight to 12 step skincare routine, which is excessive in my opinion. I don't think you're really getting a lot of benefit there, but you're also getting increased toxic load. Let's say all those products, 12 products have fragrances in them, have these PEGs in them, have these cyclic silicones in them, for example, these synthetic silicones. Are these benefiting your skin or are they making your skin worse? That's the question to ask yourself. If you're someone who's looking for topical solutions to improve your skin, then that's actually not going to serve you in the long term because skin health comes from within. Nonetheless, I digress from that. The amount of chemicals that are coming from beauty and skincare products, the Environmental Working Group estimates that the average woman is applying 168 chemicals to her skin daily. That's a pretty staggering number. If all of them, let's worst case scenario, if all of them have toxic concerns daily that you're not rinsing off, that are sitting on your skin, that have the opportunity to get absorbed into your bloodstream. And there are studies showing that people and young girls, especially who use more beauty and personal care products, have a higher load of endocrine disruptors in their bodies. But not just that. Then they have these risks for increased um, risk for polycystic ovary syndrome, endometriosis, as well as early puberty early menstruation. This is, these are highly abnormal. These are clearly endocrine disrupting. This is not normal. So if you are struggling with these types of issues, look in your beauty and personal care product routine and eliminate as much as you can these fragrances. And I'd have to imagine a challenge these days is that some of these companies are starting to get tuned in to what we're talking about today. And they're making products that are marketed toward being green, but might be total BS or only partway there. So how big of an issue is that? And how do we go through and sort and find products that are actually clean and of value? This is a big issue because greenwashing is what you're describing, which is basically the use of deceptive marketing to influence consumer behavior and, and increase the likelihood that you'll buy a product based on certain buzzwords. So companies, like you said, they're smart, they're tuning in, they're listening, they're watching social media, they're seeing what people are demanding, what are people asking for, and people are asking for cleaner, safer products. Unfortunately, the word clean is meaningless. There is no federal definition of clean. There is no federal definition of natural. So these buzzwords, you'll see on the front of a bottle, Oh, made from natural ingredients, plant-derived, non-toxic. That's also a buzzword. Who can substantiate that? None of these companies can because unless they've done the actual testing on them, which they haven't, they can't use this term, but they are because there's no, there's no uh, rep repercussions for using these terms. There are no federal guidelines or regulations to bust them. Areas like the UK and different countries around the world, they are cracking down on the use of these marketing terms, but not yet in the US. So we need to be extra cautious and look at the ingredients list. That's how you know what's actually in your product. And again, like I mentioned, the fragrance doesn't tell you the whole story because you think the word fragrance seems innocuous. It's fragrance, whatever, it smells good. But we know there's there are phthalates in there. There are carcinogens in there. And these are 
hiding in plain sight. Okay. So it sounds like there's no general standard certification or words that we can look for on packaging that'll let us know that it's clean. One thing that you can look for is USDA certified organic. In other areas of the world, I've seen in Europe, the EcoCert, Cosmos EcoCert, that's one thing that can also help as well. But becoming familiar with the ingredients list itself is key to finding safe products. Simply because without this information, if you don't know what you're looking at, then you don't really know what you're buying. And that's the issue. But there are certain things like the uh, certain verifications that you can look for. But again, you have to follow up with these companies and look at their standards to truly understand what this verification means. A lot of people think cruelty-free means it's clean. It doesn't. That just means that it wasn't tested on animals, which doesn't have anything to do with safety at all. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. We don't always need to add more. And I think that's the trap that a lot of people fall into. Let me just grab that glutathione supplement and I'm good to go. Well, you're not addressing the root cause. The root cause is your lifestyle. It's really about taking a holistic...